Welcome to this new video on Tactical Project Manager and the topic today is how to successfully manage remote projects. And the guest today is Ken Tillery. Um, Ken, just introduce yourself. Welcome. Okay. My name is Ken Tillery. I work for a global IT company. It's one of the largest. Unfortunately, I was unable to clear getting permission to tell which company I work for. But um, for the last 10 years, you could say 90% of my projects were from global. Mm -hmm. And I think for over 17 years, almost all every team I worked in was a virtual team where everybody was spread out around different countries, in some cases, different continents. When managing remote teams from your experience, what is different? communication and then the misunderstandings that can that can happen because you're dealing with people for example obviously i don't have a problem with when we're using english as the main language for the project but you'll have teams that are working together for example i know of a gentleman that's running a project he sits in germany that's not English is not his mother language and he has people on his team that's in France, Italy, parts of Scandinavia and parts of Eastern Europe. And so nobody is speaking their mother language while communicating. So you run into the misunderstandings there. And then you'll have the fact that a statement that will mean one thing in one part of the world can be totally misinterpreted in another part of the world, like a person will be trying to say sarcastic, something sarcastic, like he'll hear um, a new idea that should be tried and the person will roll their eyes going, yeah, let's try it. And the people on the other end can't really see the eye rolling and think, oh, we should try it. Yeah. <laughs> the person didn't want to these are the challenge main challenges it's the communication right and and you only notice after uh, weeks or months that uh, there's an issue probably it doesn't pop up immediately right exactly if you don't build up a good strong communication from the beginning another thing is building up trust because if you never met face to face that's another thing that has to be built up is trust Would you recommend to anyone who is doing his first remote project? What are, what are some best practices you have implemented? Well, the first thing you can do, and that's why I was in Dusseldorf when we met, is whenever possible, do your best, even if you have to find a way to bend a rule, because it's easier to get to get forgiveness than to get permission. Do your best to get the team the first couple of days together that you'll have two or three, a two or three day workshop where you're discussing the project, going out in the evening, getting to know each other. And then once you've gotten to know each other and seen each other face to face, you're, it's easier to trust someone that you've actually been able to physically reach out and touch. Mm. But in some cases, it's just flat out and simple. You're going to run into a project that has a certain executive that just refuses to hand out the money. So the next thing to do will be pick up the phone and call the person. Find the time today. Hey, how are you doing? I just wanted to call chit chat. Yeah. And schedule that you'll have 15, 10 to 15 minutes where you're talking about the job, but another 20 to 30 minutes where you just, yeah, I like this soccer team. What kind of uh, sports do you like? Do you don't like sport? Oh, okay. What's your favorite food? Just to get to know each other mm. and get to know you that they, to build up the trust and the good feeling. Right. That's, the, that's one, one of the things to do. Yeah. So it's not just about discussing work topics, but also to connect on a personal level, which is really important, but it's, uh, it takes additional time, which you don't, which you cannot dedicate to the project work itself. But, right. but I guess it will pay off in the long run. Exactly. Because when you have a team that trusts you, and I have actually had that, I was working, before I was working as a dedicated project manager, I was a service delivery manager, and I had two people reporting to my team 
two years long. Not once did we get a chance to meet face to face, but you know, we shared a few pictures. We got to know like one of them. I knew that he he was a botanist on the side, and I, I learned his different plant life. And I even made sure during that time he was working for me when I went to visit my parents in Florida to send him nice pictures of plants and stuff he liked. So it kept that good relationship going. Mm. And eventually I did meet him six months after I left that department. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he immediately was happy to finally meet me face to face, but we had already built up a good relationship. Right. And it was a known fact if I ever had a project again and he was there, I would immediately get him because we had already built up a relationship and we had that trust. Mm. And wh how does it change the the work relationship and also the I wouldn't say efficiency, but the you know the the level of the, the the quality of the collaboration in a project? How does it change once you have or after you have met? What's your what what have you observed here? Well, once you meet face to face, it's easier to understand a person's what they're coming from when they're trying to make extra schedules and extra meetings. And that's why you want to try to at least have one face-to-face -face meeting at the beginning. But if you can't do that, then you do the telephone call where you can meet the person. And that's what it is, is you got to get the trust. Mm -hmm. And of course, the next thing is building up the communication plan. Like right now, even, even I was complaining that since we've got back, there was a design that has to be built up. And in the end, I'm just shaking my head on one side. I'm like, oh, I'm just so sick of it. We've had five calls today on the same thing. And then on the other side, I know for a fact, we have to have these five calls because we got people from Czech Republic, France, and Germany trying to explain to each other and, and understand what they're saying. And you just have to invest more time to get the communication in. Yeah. And do you, when you have like this kind of scattered team, do you um, ask your team to collaborate uh, between each other or are you always part of these meetings? In, in the beginning phase, I'm usually a part of the meetings. I'm, I'm, in some cases, I'm almost like a dictator, <laughs> authoritarian leadership, if you know the different levels. So you'll start as the authoritarian and then move to Democrat and in the end lays it fair. Very often, because I'm usually with a team that's worked with me before, I'm from the beginning to the end a laser fair meet leader. Yeah. Like currently, one of the guys in Dusseldorf asked me, or, or not in Dusseldorf, but in this current project, asked me if I'm going to schedule the meeting. And I just said, I don't need to schedule the meeting because my IT architect is already doing that because I know him. I've worked with the IT architect that's directly on my team before. Yeah. And he just simply took the lead and started doing it. So with him personally, I can be the, from beginning to end a laissez-faire leader. And with him, my job is to make sure everybody else, all the other stakeholders that have something to say, leave him alone, mm. which is even in a face-to-face -face environment. But we've already built up that trust. I've met him face-to-face -face three times over the last three years. That's something I've noticed as well. Like after you have met, and you have built this trust you people respond more quickly to to email or they they provide the the work in a in a more in a faster way and which which helps the overall project whereas when you haven't met it's like very anonymous and and you you don't know whether the person is working on a topic or not and mm -hmm. but whereas when you have met it's kind of you you know the person is is, uh, is, is providing the input you are asking him to do. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, when, so you mentioned like meet the ideal, in the ideal case, you meet physically at the start of the project to build up this trust. You, you connect on a personal level. And now you mentioned the communication plan. So how, how does that look like? Well, that one you have to, from day one, you have to sit together and build up, build up, a, what do you call, a set of rules, mm -hmm. ground rules on how you will communicate. Especially when you're getting with people you haven't met before, like, okay, what are we going to use? 
Can we, we have like our online chat tool we, that works for most people. I have one incident where the person was physically going into a data center and he couldn't be logged into it at all times, but he promised and we made sure of it. And he did whenever we wrote him an email asking for information within two hours, because of the time we had to give him the time that he was working in the serve in the uh, data center building stuff. Mm. Within two hours, we would have a reply, and we even said, please reply saying at least that you've received the email. In some cases, if you lose, use tools like Lotus Notes, when you send an email, you can have it set up when the person opens it and reads it, it automatically lets you know, oh, he just got my email, he's reading it. And then you have written in there and in the ground rules from day one, he writes back, yes, I have your email. I'm looking at it. Ah, and, okay. and then immediately, if he doesn't say in that email, you write back, when can I get an answer? And whoever is the project leader, mm. that is the most important to remember, especially in a global team where everybody's spread out, make sure you have a deadline. I would like an answer by this time. Mm. Mm. If they don't get an answer, you pick up the telephone and call them. How come I do not have an answer? And sometimes there's a legitimate reason they didn't yet have an answer. Sometimes, like in one case, especially when you're dealing with people that are working for your project and they're, in, they're somewhere in, uh, in Nigeria, they will have a power outage and can't contact you. Mm. But phone works so you just pick it you just take have that in your mind you know that you pick up the phone yes he's in a country where the interest for a structure is not that great i'm going to pick up a phone and call him mm. and the answer immediately ah, okay. and yeah that's just common sense communication 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 mm. and trust 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 that, that makes a lot of sense yeah because otherwise if you don't have these kind of rules established as a project manager, you're always thinking about, you know, why is why am I not getting a response? Uh, it's Friday, and I and I need this. It's a deadline today. But if you have told your team to to communicate back whether they have completed a topic or not, then it kind of helps to plan plan for the next steps, and you know where you are right now. Besides rules, you also mentioned scheduling meetings. So I think a lot of people, including myself, we always think, you know, how many, how, in what frequency should we set up meetings, uh, weekly or biweekly, and what time? So what are some ground rules for, for having a meeting structure? For those, we try to set that from day one, and usually, especially if you can't get a face-to-face -face meeting. You'll have a daily meeting. You'll have one, what I, what I sometimes call an initial kickoff call, but not the actual kickoff to the project, mm. where we all meet. Hello, my name's Ken. Hello, my name's Billy. And everybody goes around introducing. And, and a primary part of this discussion is when are we going to have meetings? When is everyone free? And of course, you're bouncing between a democratic leader and an authoritative leader because they're all going to have a thousand reasons they can't make a certain schedule. And then you just sit there and say, I, we, I will schedule a meeting at this time. Mm, mm. And you make it very clear. And eventually, they'll all agree. And then the beginning, you might have five meetings a week each morning. And then the following week, after with an agreement, you can have like Monday, uh, the meeting, okay, this is what needs to be done this week, any discussion, any reason, then Friday you have a, what have we completed? Mm. And usually the Friday, and sometimes the Friday is actually a Thursday meeting because as a project manager, you got to go to some director or vice president, whatever, and let them know what happened. So you need that information uh, Thursday. Mm. And every now and then, if the team is not too big, it's enough if you have, for example, sometimes I only have an um, IT architect and two IT specialists. And so it's enough that by Thursday before close business, IT architect writes down, this is what happened. 
and then I take that and to the um, primary stakeholder. This is what we've got done. This is what we still need in accordance to the IT architect. Right, right. And so basically you're, you start with a high frequency of meetings, maybe even daily at the beginning, right? And then you can reduce the, the frequency over time. Exactly. And it can happen that towards the closing of the, of the project in the last days when you're putting in the last minute stuff and you're doing all the testing and handovers, you'll have a high frequency of meetings again. But you can be a little bit loose on the people that are actually doing because you have your IT architect and IT specialist, as in my, in my area. They're really sitting there in the room doing stuff. So you don't want to make them spend too much time in a meeting, but you really want to make sure that the customer is happy and sees that you're doing it. And there's the only way you can explain it is having a telephone conference with them. But that's on the management side and not so much on the side of the ones doing the actual work. Mm. And, mm. and one thing I've heard also from my team is that people complain when there are too many meetings. Um, uh, but yeah, the meetings are necessary. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, how do you counter this argument? I just say, okay. We'll have some meetings, and if needed, we'll start skipping some meetings, and we'll cut down the number. Like I said, we start out from having five week to two, sometimes just one. And I, I don't think I've had it happen where it's just about every time I turn around, I'll reduce it to having one, and then one or two of the people that complained and wanted fewer meetings will start, well, let's have another meeting. Uh -huh. <laughs> and sometimes I just have the once a week meeting, and then I'll end up with three other meetings that the architect or the specialist wants to have afterwards. Mm, I understand. Which is quite funny because that was the one that didn't want the meetings, but then he's scheduling some more meetings. Tell me, I mean, a core part is uh, tracking the tasks and, and letting the team know what they have to do. How do you technically organize that you have a web-based task management solution or how does it work in your projects? Yeah, you know, we have a, like a web-based tool. There's a new one, they, new one they just introduced. I saw it, I logged into it the first time yesterday. They talked about it three times in Dusseldorf, but or help me, I can't remember the name of it. But it's not much different than having a version of an online version of MS project or now because my company switched switched us to uh, Macintosh books, I have the uh, open project. And I just have a list of milestones that have to be reached. Sometimes I, I just use MS Excel. Yeah. And I put it on a box, on, on like, an, like a box that when a person logs in, nobody else can touch it. And they go in, this is, was my task, this is what I did, and then it's closed, and then I know they completed that task. Mm. And if at the end of the day, one of one of the, um, for example, an IT specialist that's doing hands-on work, he doesn't, he doesn't, he isn't necessarily going to be online. I usually end up picking up the phone, and I haven't done it as often, but I've had it happen where, especially with the with a with a case with a gentleman in Nigeria, because because literally he was losing IT connections. So I would pick up the phone. Okay, I don't see any anything in the book. Yes, yes, uh, this is what happened. And he immediately lets me know. And after a while, he just started picking up his phone and calling me. Okay. Saying, telling me his update. And I'd say, okay, thank you. And then I would write it down. And it's just, you make sure that each person's t milestones are written in, that they know what their milestones are. And with me, I just sit back and say, and I tell them, all, like I told the IT architect on my current project, I said, you're the guru, you're the, you're the expert on this, that's why you have that title, that's why you're doing it. You tell me if, the, if this project plan is doable, and then each week we'll measure up why it was reached, and they know that. Mm. And when you get new people on the team, then you make sure to make extra effort to let them know. I have a task list. We worked on it. You agreed to it. I want by the by a certain time 
whenever each milestone is to be met, I want a statement of if it was met or why it was not met and what is to be done to reach the milestone or if there's a workaround, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of discussions between, between you and the team. Uh, do you also re regularly write minutes or how do you document these decisions? I, I, I keep a, a document of, I keep a list of meeting minutes. They'll, they'll sit there and they'll see a file that they can go through and discuss with me afterwards. I'll, I'll sit there at, at the computer. And recently I had a, another project manager sit with me saying, let's each write minutes. And then we compared the notes and then we put on our little, on our little team room that can be reached by everyone, a copy of the minutes, and then they can go through there, read through the minutes. No, no, that's not what was discussed. We meant that, okay, we'll change it. But that's how we do it. We keep every meeting, someone keeps the meeting minutes. Primarily, I try to, unless I'm sharing a presentation, then I'll get someone else to write them. Mm -hmm. And that's how it works. You're a project manager with many years of experience. What would you recommend anyone who is new to the field, what to focus on? Trust and communication, those two areas. Those two areas. And that is also where you spend most of your time on, I, I suppose. Yes. Well, to get the project running, of course, a lot of time documenting it and filing it, that people see the written proof, lots of writing. I know, I know a lot of project managers, they come, they spend a lot of time, more time than I do making a perfect project plan everything looks beautiful in writing but then the project is done because the team wants it done and i prefer having the people want to work for me and if and i feel successful when i'm sitting there and i and someone hears i'm i've taken over a project and they say oh i would like to work for him again that's because great. i've built up that trust that's yes. my goal Ah, that's awesome. Yes, I, I, I know that feeling because then you know really you have done a good job. Not, not just on a technical level, but people actually like working with you, which is really great. You, you have observed also many young project managers. In what areas do you think they should improve? Uh, the communication, flat out simple. Yeah. Communicating and trust. But like I said, communication is the top most important. Mm. And making sure that the others are communicating with each other too, because when you're communicating with them, you 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 ask them, and I think you mentioned this before. Are you communicating with that team? Have you spoken with that person? Do you plan to set up a meeting on your own with that person? Because I had an IT architect saying, "I need a I need a meeting with this person at this time." And and the first couple of times I set the meetings for him, then after a while I came back to him. I said. Look, uh, can you not set the meeting with him? It's more important that you. Yeah. And he thought about it, and then he wrote back to me on the chat tool. You're right. I can schedule these meetings on my own. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. that's kind of funny. And uh, I'll run into a lot of project managers. They'll micromanage because... If I keep setting the meetings for the other people, then I'm micromanaging too, right. if I did what we wanted. Yeah. And in a global team, micromanagers, well. You drown. They, yeah. 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 <laughs> they get overworked too. <laughs> I scheduled the first two initial meetings to make sure I have everyone. Yeah. And then I immediately, because the trust is most important and I'm not running a fire department trying to put out a fire. I want everybody to know I'm the project manager. And then I don't want them to feel that I'm the project manager. So then I immediately, the moment I step in and it, it, let them know who I am and what, what's expected, I immediately go snap into the democratic mode. Mm. That they saying, okay, when should we have the meetings? What time does everybody have? Who's dedicated 100% to this project? Who's not? 
and I try to get that all out of the way the first day, the first couple of meetings, that everybody can get relaxed and get into the working mode mm. because of the team with the team building and everything. So the dictator is, or the authoritative leader, that's, yeah, that's done within one hour. I can even go back to my military experience because even a uh, soldier, the stereotype sergeant in the army who's running around, you're going to do what I say. He doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. In fact, if he does do that and goes to battle, he'll be the first one to get shot. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. He builds up trust as well. He, he's going to drink and stuff because he wants to build up trust. And the same goes and goes because I left the military a long time ago. And one thing I learned there is you need to have your people trust you. Mm. And the same goes as a project manager. Your people have to trust you. And if you're the from day one, like – as I mentioned, you have the day, first day, you're kind of the authoritarian because we have a meeting, we need you here, here's our set of rules, they have to be followed, this is the communication plan, and why it's the communication plan. And that's, yeah, maybe for the first hour. But after that, you go into a democratic mode, and when people really get to know and you can really trust them, then you're the lays affair and you can just sit back, relax, know what they're doing and write your project plan, get your presentations together for the stakeholders. And but be prepared because it has happened that it can happen, it will happen. And everyone that's just starting out as project management, be prepared. You're gonna have someone. Can you have this done by this time? Sure, I'll have it done. It's not done. Mm. You don't know why. Mm. And even in an environment, because I've ran into people that said, I hate people that work from home. I'm like, yeah, I caught these people. Example, first I was in a company, we caught a guy. He spent the entire day hiding in the elevator. Oh, He never had any work done. He was really? hiding in the elevator right there in a team that was all located in the same office. And you got to be prepared for that. If this guy's not meeting milestones, you got to be pre prepared to escalate him. And then you turn back into the authoritarian. Either you get it done or I'll find someone who can. And I will speak with your first line manager and my first line manager and we'll take care of it and find someone mm. else. You got to be prepared for that one. Yeah. But lucky for me, the last couple of years, I haven't had that happen. I had it happen one time and it wasn't a, it wasn't very nice, and quite honestly, I don't like having to escalate a person, mm. but it can happen. you got to be prepared for it. Sometimes you have to do it, yeah. Exactly. Mm. And, and, but the... and you just show it. I had this task to be done. He, he agreed to it. He didn't do it. Yeah, but that's particularly hard in a remote environment when you can't just walk by and see what the person is doing. Uh, whether he's surfing on Facebook or, or yeah. doing, doing his job. So it's really hard. I don't really look at that, but as I said, in fact, the guy that I caught riding in the elevator, I caught him in the, in the company out with, on loan with a subcontractor, and he was hiding in another break room the whole day and not doing his job. Mm, mm. And, yeah. He, he was only there a month and they sent him back to the, uh, it was one of these, uh, now I can't speak my own home language. I've been in Germany too long. Zeitarbeitsfirma. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, one of these companies that loan an employee out to another company. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. No, that's... I mean, you're going to catch that no matter what. And so that's why I don't even worry about, about whether it's remote or yeah. central. If you want to goof off, you're going to find a way to goof off. <laughs> yes, yes. I want to ask again about this building trust, about building trust. Uh, you mentioned like asking about the hobbies. Uh, what, are some, what are some topics or some strategies for connecting with people, you know, on this personal level? Well, the same thing you do in real life in the United States, we have the same Two, two subjects to avoid that will end a friendship. 
politics and religion. Keep those two subjects out. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, be, be prepared to understand, especially with the thousands of cultures that you're going to run into, that there's going to be people, for example, they're a vegetarian and a person that likes to hunt. <laughs> and, and you have to accept that someone sees topics different and you look for something because no matter what, I've sat there and I've watched someone that would, if you would talk to them politically, they would be total 180 of each other, the to opposite sides of the street, but they both liked Star Trek mm. or they both liked vanilla ice cream and you just try to get them to find common ground on something that they work together. Yeah. And that, that's the main thing. You try to avoid any subject that you know is, in the end, it's never going to be important to your everyday work life. Mm. And you look for what's common ground. Like current current one, I kind of felt weird because I was one of three people that didn't have a dog. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And everybody loved talking about their dogs. And I was able to find common ground because even though I don't have a dog, when I was growing up, I spent all of my summers at my grandfather's ranch, and there yeah. we had two dogs we used for for driving the cattle, and so I talked about those dogs. Okay, so you're, you're, you're making real effort to, to find a common ground and to find topics that, that are of interest to the others. That's great. Exactly. Yeah. And in one case, I ran into a person who was talk, talking about... His, um, his time as a windsurfer. This is a subject, I, me, I don't think I would ever try windsurfing, I, even though I am a, I do like athletic stuff, but I just got him to sit there because I wanted him to want to work on our project. So I said, so you're a windsurfer? Yes, please. And I, and I listened to him. Now I'm kind of more interested in the subject. At the time I wasn't, but... Mm. I got him to explain it and what kind of surfboards, the different makes. There were different, thousands of different models and brands. And I just sat there 15 minutes long, keeping my mouth shut while he explained it. And that's what you, what you do. In fact, I would recommend every project manager read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. And when you're actually running a project, to read the one minute ma manage by Kenneth uh, Bl Blanchard. Blanchard, right. Ah, okay. Great. In fact, one minute manager, I can probably explain the whole book in, in one sec, in 30 seconds. Someone has a problem, you sit them down and say, okay, explain the problem and what you're supposed to do about it. And 80% and of the time, within a, within a minute, they come up with their own solution. Yeah, <laughs> without you having to fix it. Yeah. Exactly, and that's the entire basis of the One Minute Manager, and I highly recommend that book and the Dale Carnegie books on how to win friends. Those are the two. Yeah, yeah. So some some uh, pieces from Dale Carnegie's book is, I think, like when you connect with people to, to mention their name, to call them by their name. Exactly. And uh, to... Probably also to connect on this personal level, on talking about hobbies, things like that. I think yes. some of the strategies, yeah. Well, that, that one I used with the gentleman that now has me more interested in windsurfing than I was before I met him, that came from Dale Carnegie. It was right there in the book, and I just pulled it right out of the book and got a guy to tell me about windsurfing. Ah, okay. Ah, yeah, that, exactly. To, to ask questions and to be curious about the other person. And, and, like, and as I point out, it doesn't matter where the person is from, what culture they are from. Yeah. If you, you will find, like it or not, if you really want to, you will find something of interest mm. to you for, that that person knows. And you just sit quietly and start asking them questions and let that person talk and be the center of attention. Mm. And, Great and, advice. Yeah. Wow, cool. 
I think we can we can all learn, learn a lot from this conversation, or we have learned a lot from this conversation, uh, like uh, establishing communication rules and building up trust and to to have a successful uh, remote team. Thanks a lot, Ken. It was really interesting for for the viewers and for me. I, I really learned a lot and <laughs> hoping to talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah. Man. Hopefully we'll meet again. <laughs> in the train or in Düsseldorf or somewhere else. Or down the road in Stuttgart. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we're actually around the corner. It's not too far. Right. Horp. Okay, have a great weekend. You too. Take care.